Alright everybody, tonight we're going to have a look at my Black Ghost Knife Fish tank. I threw some shrimp pellets in there, so hopefully uh, this time we'll actually get to see the fish that the tank is named after. Uh, There's no guarantee, but hopefully within a few minutes it'll be making an appearance coming out and investigating the delicious shrimp smell that is permeating the tank at the moment. Tonight I want to talk about water hardness and why water hardness is so important. When you look at care sheets or care parameters for fish, you will often see uh, DGH or degrees of general hardness that a fish is supposed to be kept in. And I think a lot of times people just kind of overlook that. They don't really understand it. They don't know what it means. So they just sort of don't worry about it. They don't really know what their water hardness is. They just kind of say, well, the fish are living in my fish store's water, so they can probably live in mine. It's not necessarily true. Um, a good example would be when you go to the fish store and you see African cichlids. Uh, they're kept in the same water for the most part, unless you go to a really, you know, higher quality shop that actually separates their, um, you know, fish into different types of water. But your big name, you know, your big big chain pet stores, they're all it's all one water system. All those fish are kept in the same water, and the idea is they're not going to be in it for very long. They get the fish in, they stay in there for a week or two, and then they're gone, and then they go home to your water. Now, whether they die in your water or not is not their problem. So, why is the water hardness something that really does need to be considered? African cichlids might be an extreme example, but they're a good example because they're sort of well known, it's kind of well understood, everybody knows they need to be kept in pretty hard water and most people have to actually doctor their water and add minerals to it to make it hard enough for those fish to thrive and do well. And the secret to it or the key behind it is osmoregulation. Now I just got finished shooting a video about my brackish tank where I discussed urihaline animals otherwise known or more commonly known as brackish animals or brackish fish. Um, the fish we're looking at in this tank and African cichlids and most freshwater fish or saltwater fish are known as stenohaline animals. That means they have to be within a very narrow range of salinity. Now salinity does not necessarily mean salty water the way uh, you or I might think about it tasting salty. The salinity or the specific gravity is the amount of dissolved mineral salts that are in the water. So the African cichlid water does have a higher salinity than the tank you're looking at, for example. It's just not the salts that you might think of. But if I were to look at it through my uh, refractometer, I'm sure it would have a higher specific gravity than the tank we're looking at right now. So the reason is Certain fish have evolved to live in certain conditions. The fish in the tank that you're looking at, most of them need to be in fairly soft or softer water. The barbs can kind of go through a fairly wide range. They're pretty adaptable. But most of the fish in this tank, and most of my fish in general, need to be in fairly soft water. And the reason is because of evolving in water like this, their internal um, cellular makeup, the amount of minerals and dissolved solids they have inside their cells needs to match pretty closely with the amount of dissolved solids that are in the water that they're in. And the reason is osmoregulation. These fish don't have the ability to actively osmoregulate the way a urihaline animal does. The water will move in and out of its cells, but it has to be water that's fairly close to what is already on the inside of its cells. Now, the way osmosis works, and I guess I'll explain that, and then that will make what I'm saying about the fish make a lot more sense. The way osmosis works is sort of like diffusion, but in reverse. The way diffusion works is you have an area of higher concentration of dissolved solids are going to want to spread out. Those dissolved solids are going to want to move away from each other in an open water environment. Imagine the tank we're looking at now. If I put a piece of rock salt in the bottom of the tank, even if there was no water movement, if the, if the tank was perfectly still, the salt as it dissolved into the water would want to spread out and move away from itself and if we gave it enough time and we came back and we checked that salt would be dissolved and evenly dispersed throughout the water that's the process of diffusion well 
Osmosis works on the same principle, but it involves a semi-permeable membrane. So now let's imagine the same tank, but let's put a membrane down the middle of that tank, and only water molecules can get through that membrane. No other molecules except for water can get through that membrane. So now if we take a chunk of rock salt and we put it on one side of that membrane, it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to dissolve, it's going to diffuse, but it's only going to diffuse into the area on, we'll say, the left side of the membrane. The water to the right side of the membrane is still going to be much, much less specific gravity. There's much less dissolved solids in it. It has a lower concentration of dissolved solids in it. So now what's going to happen is instead of the salts on the one side being able to spread out through the whole tank, the water is effectively going to want to dilute the salty side to make it the same throughout the tank. So water is going to begin moving from the right side of the tank to the left side of the tank. And eventually what would happen is you would actually get a difference in water level. It would be very, very, very slight in this case, but for the sake of making it understandable, you literally would have water would move from one side of the tank to the other to attempt to dilute it. Now eventually gravitational pressure is going to override osmotic pressure, that's why you're not going to get a whole lot of shift, but theoretically you are going to have water move and you're going to have more water on the other side than you do on the lower salinity side. So the same exact thing is happening inside your fish's cells. The cell wall would be that membrane down the middle and the amount of dissolved solids inside the cell versus the amount of dissolved solids in the water outside the cell, the same process is going to occur. If you've got a whole lot of dissolved solids inside the cell, you're going to have this nice fresh lower concentration of water rushing into the cells to try to dilute the salinity inside the cell. And what happens is you get so much water rushing in there that the cells actually rupture or can rupture because of the water coming in. If they don't rupture, you're still getting so much water coming in that it's diluting the amount of dissolved solids that are supposed to be inside the cell. These dissolved solids are effectively electrolytes which are used in muscle contraction and nerve control and nerve conduction. So these animals need these amounts of electrolytes to stay stable inside their cells. So let's say you take one of these freshwater fish that's in, or I'm sorry, softwater fish and you put it in hard water. Soft water means it has a much, much lower concentration of dissolved solids. Hard water has a much, much higher concentration of dissolved solids. So you take a fish that's supposed to be in soft water and you put it in hard water. Now you've actually got more dissolved solids outside of the cells of the fish. And what happens is the, the water inside the cells moves out. It tries to dilute the water in the tank. So your fish will actually dehydrate and die from dehydration because the water inside its cells is actually moving out to try to dilute the water in the tank. The opposite happens when you take a hard water fish, like an African cichlid, and you put it in soft water. The fish's internal cells has so much more dissolved solids than the water outside the fish that the tank water then rushes into the fish you know, it's moving again through that semi-permeable membrane into the side that has more dissolved solids and it begins filling that side up. So your African cichlid is now suddenly in soft water and water is rushing into its cells trying to dilute the cells. If it's not such a disparity that it actually ruptures the fish's cells, it's still going to be enough of a disparity that it's going to knock the fish's electrolytes all out of whack. It's just going to do a lot of things to the animal that aren't going to be good for it. And depending on the animal and the animal's ability to adapt, <coughs> excuse me, and how quickly you shift it, uh, gouramis are, are a pretty adaptable fish. But if you've got a gourami that's been living in really hard water and you just take it and you put it in a, a tank that's got two or three degrees hardness, 
you may kill it. That's a big shock to go through quickly. Just because the gourami can live in 15 degrees hardness or 8 degrees hardness or 5 degrees hardness, we'll say, doesn't mean it can go from 15 or 18 degrees hardness down to 5 or 8 degrees hardness suddenly. It's still going to be a big osmotic shock internally to the animal. These barbs are the same way. They can live in a fairly wide range of hardness and a lot of fish can be adapted to yeah, just outside of its comfort zone but it's still not anything that can be done really rapidly. These barbs, if I had been, you know, if I had gotten them from, say, a friend that was keeping them in African cichlid water, this really hard water, and then brought them home and just put them right in my very soft water, they probably wouldn't have survived for more than a day or two. They just would not be able to make that shift that dramatically. So even fish that need to live, that, you know, that can adapt to a wide range of hardnesses, you still need to take into consideration when you bring them home from the fish store, ask how hard the water is or simply get a hardness test and test the water. I always test the water when I bring fish home from the fish store. I test the nitrates, I test the hardness, um, I always just check to see if there's any ammonia or nitrites in the water just to get an understanding of if the animal's been suffering and if there's any gill damage that's been done uh, due to ammonia poisoning etc. But testing the hardness is a good place to start. Testing the pH is a good place to start. The pH can tell you a lot about the hardness. This isn't always a uh, you know, hand-in-hand ratio, but generally the higher your pH, the harder the water. The lower the pH, the softer the water. Again, this is a general rule of thumb, but that's something to go by. If you don't have a water hardness test kit, but you've got a pH test kit, check the pH. If you bring it home and it's a 7.8 pH, it's probably reasonably hard water. You know, you're probably looking at 12 degrees of hardness or thereabouts. If you know you have very soft water, maybe take a little more time to acclimate the fish. Take a few days of keeping it, you know, I recommend keeping it in a quarantine tank for six weeks if you bring any fish home. And six weeks is a good time to slowly bring the fish from the hardness of the water you brought it home in to the hardness of the water you've got if it's a big difference. If it's not, don't worry about it. If it's the kind of fish that's fairly flexible like a gourami or a barb and you've got a five degree difference in water hardness, probably not going to make that big of a deal. If you've got certain fish, you know, that really need to be in soft water and you've got reasonably hard water, well, that's something you need to take into consideration. If it's, you know, you, you're, you're going to have to stay within certain parameters. If it's a fish that needs to be in, say, 12 to 18 degrees, I wouldn't recommend bringing it home and putting it in two degrees hardness. It's just not going to be able to go that far outside of where its comfort zone is. If you've got 10 degrees hardness and 12 is its bottom end, you'll probably be fine. You know, you, 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 can, you can push it a little beyond where it says the fish needs to be. But it's all going to take its toll. The further you go outside of its comfort range, the more rapidly it's going to wear the fish's body out by working harder than it should to maintain its internal um, salinity, you know, it maintain that osmoregulation that is so critical to keeping these fish alive. That's what this is all about, is osmoregulation. So with the brackish fish, they need to stay in a certain salinity just to ease their system, even though they can go within a wide range of salinities. These fish need to stay in a very, very narrow range of salinity, but within that we get to the subset of dissolved solids of hardness, and these fish actually need to stay even within a reasonably narrow range of hardness. So that's another key thing to think about when you're deciding on what fish you want to keep or what fish you want to keep together in the same tank, etc., etc. So unfortunately we did not get to see the black ghost knife fish come out. I did see it stick its head out once or twice, kind of threw me off. I got being distracted thinking we were going to get to see it. So hopefully I kept uh, on target there through most of that and made some sort of cohesive sense as I rambled my way through it. So please leave any questions or comments down below. Uh, thank you for watching this one as always. And of course I would ask you to subscribe. That way you don't miss anything that's coming up. And again, thanks for watching this one. And I'll see you real soon on the next one.